Welcome back to the series I'm calling Everything I Know About Backpacking in the Eastern Sierra. This section is about your feet and about walking and about what you're going to put on your feet. So there is an eternal debate <clears throat> going on between hiking boots on one side and trail runners or running shoes on the other side. Let me break it down for you. <clears throat> hiking boots are heavier on your feet and some say that a pound on your feet is equal to five pounds on your back in terms of how nimble you are and your moving speed. They're heavier, but they provide more protection for your feet and more support. And trail runners are way lighter and they provide less protection for your feet and support. Uh, they also fall apart way quicker. So um, these hiking boots I'll talk about in a minute. Um, let's start with the trail runners. These are Solomon trail runners. A couple things about shoes you want to think about. The tang, the tang of the boot or the shoe is a piece in the middle that prevents it from flexing. Right, so this trail runner I can flex like that. Otherwise it's pretty stiff. Compared to a normal running shoe, here's a normal running shoe. You could fold this in half almost anywhere along the, the sole. Um, so a trail runner is going to be have more traction on the bottom. It's going to have dirt in it. It's going to have more traction on the bottom, it's going to be a little more durable, um, and it's going to be a little stiffer in the tang. And hopefully it'll provide a little more support to you than a running shoe. Um, whereas a boot, I can't really flex this under, I can flex it a little bit. When I'm wearing it, it flexes. Um, but it's a lot heavier. It's a lot heavier tang, there's a lot heavier, heavier duty sole. Um, this one has ankle support, you can get some light duty hiking shoes, trail runners, well they're not called trail runners if they have ankle support, but this is a heavy duty boot. <clears throat> this particular boot is made by Peter Limmer in um, Intervale, New Hampshire. Um, he is like a fourth generation boot maker. Great grandfather started making shoes and boots on all leather in Germany. His father or his grandfather had the very first ski boot patent um, in New Hampshire in the, uh, the early 1900s and he still makes his boots um, by hand and they're custom made to your feet. So what he does is he measures your feet, you go in, he measures your feet, he takes tracings and then you wait three years, that's his waiting list sometimes, I guess it was a year and a half recently but I had to wait three years. And then he says come on in, you came up in the queue, you go in again, he measures your feet to make sure they haven't changed because a lot of times your arches will fall, your feet will swell or you'll gain a lot of weight or you'll lose a lot of weight. And he creates this leather boot to fit you perfectly. It's one piece of leather. The only seam on it is right here, which means uh, there's really no place for moisture to get into it. And as long as you treat it well, it's pretty damn waterproof. Um, and I found these to be excellent. While we're talking about heavy boots, let's talk about the range of the spectrum. Those are all leather, traditional, traditionally handcrafted hiking boots. These cost me $700. I saved for years to be able to afford them. Um, but as all leather custom-made, handmade hiking, I mean, think about it, it takes a week for someone to make this, right? So do, do you make $700 in a week? You know, that's maybe kind of a good deal, actually. And there are other people that do this. Um, e. Sato in Vancouver charged 900 bucks. John Calden, Colorado, it's like 1200 bucks. A guy named Leahy in Santa Cruz is about $2,000. So 700 bucks is actually a great deal, and Pete Limmer is also a great guy. I'm actually going to be up in New Hampshire next week and maybe I'll be able to splice in a little segment uh, interview with him just talking about his boots. They're making the traditional custom fit leather boot and they also have what they're calling stock boots. So it's just like any other boot, they make them in a bunch of sizes and if they fit you, great. Uh, that was the first pair of limmers I had and those were really good um, for a while. They didn't fit me perfectly because I have weird shaped feet. If you have normal shaped feet and you fit great into stock boots, Praise you, right? <laughs> Be thankful for that because if you can buy a $200 pair of boots off the shelf that fit you great and you can have for years, that's great. My feet are wonky and so um, these boots, they are just a dream. They, there's no break-in period. Usually with a, he with a heavy boot like this, you have a break-in period. You know, um, what you don't want to do is buy a pair of shoes or boots and then hike on them the next day. You want to wear them around. You want to wear them a week or so. You want to go on little hikes to break them in. Uh, cause you, the boot needs to expand and contract based on the shape of your foot. So I have weird shaped feet, so these have been great for me. If you have weird shaped feet or you have a problem 
with you, I get a lot of blisters or you're, f you're having a problem finding a shoe that fits, I highly recommend a custom pair of boots. $700, that's a lot. Why is that worth it? It's worth it because people have these boots for 20 years, 30 years. Um, you can resole these boots. It's a typical Norwegian welt design, so you just undo this line of stitching and you can put a new sole on them if they wear out. They're infinitely, not infinitely, but they're very repairable. If they rip, if these things come out, you just send them back in, they get repaired. Um, that's the main reason I got them, is because I wanted a heavyweight pair of boots that was going to last me a really long time, and because I'm a huge proponent of supporting artisans and people that do things the old way. You can go out and buy a pair of shoes or boots that come off the assembly line and it's like one of 3,000 other pair and they're made in some faraway country. But to be able to support one guy whose father and grandfather did the same thing and that's how he makes his livelihood and he hand makes it, that's something completely different and that's something I'm a big fan of. So um, that's my spiel about Limmer Boot. Like I said, hopefully I'll have a little video in there of Pete. His workshop is phenomenal. If you're ever in New Hampshire, go into Intervale and just stop in. Um, he's super friendly. The, the place is plastered with postcards that people have sent of uh, pictures of them wearing their boots to different parts of the world. Um, really, really awesome place. So I highly recommend Pete Limmer. Here we are in Intervale, New Hampshire. Limmer and Sons, custom shoemaker since 1919. And here's the building where they've been making shoes since 1950. Check it out. He loves entertaining. And like I said, there's just tons and tons of pictures sent in by happy footed customers. This one's Fitzroy in Patagonia. A bunch of them from Everest. Speak of the help. devil, this is Peter Limmer himself and Ken in the back. Ken, say hi. Ken's the repairman. Pete's working on some custom boots right now. Ken, this is a union shop. <laughs> have a lumber store to get you two, two by fours. You know, otherwise right. they're going to send you every pretzel that they got. It's a good picture of a foot tracing right here. And these are all the custom boots he's working on right now. This is really the, the uh, inner sole is going to be the anchor to the whole boot. It's, it's what everything is adhered to on this piece of leather. We use an oak tan piece of leather because it is moldable to the bottom of the foot. It's part of the break-in, but it's just like tooling a belt. Once your boot's broken in, you'll be able to feel where your foot sits right inside the boot. This is the repair rack at Limmer Boot. Some of these boots are 15, 20, 30. What did you say the oldest one here was? 35? They're 35 years old, yeah. You can tell by the hardware. So how many steps are there in making a boot? Probably about 35 or 40. And that's, you know, without making the uppers and everything. I mean, it starts out with a foot model. And then there's two different lasting sessions. One is a wet and one is a dry. So how long does it take start to finish usually? Uh, I say that they're in work for 40 hours, but 20 hours are drying time and 20 hours are hands-on. Yep. And again, that's why I do a dozen at a time, because by the time I get done with the 12th one, the first one's dry enough to be able to work the next stage. And it's probably time to go drink a beer, too. Correct. Giving out all my secrets. <laughs> These are stock boots here. They got fun little boot cut in half. These are the standards, the mid-weights and the lightweights. The first pair I had were the lightweights. This is a 1930s vintage. Hobnail. That pattern right there is what Vitali Bramani used to start the fibrum pattern. Wow. I'm fond of saying when you hiked in that boot, you could eat a pound of bacon and a dozen eggs and didn't have to worry about cholesterol. Yeah. And that boot right there is very much like the boot George Mallory was found on Everest in. Awesome. So this is the shop, as I said, there's postcards from happy customers and Pete's here most days. Stop in and say hi to him. Yeah, absolutely. Here's the obligatory Mount Washington Overlook. There it is with its head in the clouds. Tallest mountain in the Northeast. Very nice. So why did I go with really heavy hiking boots? Well, these are my trail runners. You can see they've got a lot of wear on them. 
And I wore these hiking a number of time, times. Here's the difference for me. You won't see any through hikers wearing super heavy boots. You just won't. If they're doing 20 miles a day, 30 miles a day, being nimble on your feet is great. The other thing they do is they're on a trail. They're on a trail the entire time. They're not scrambling over rocks in places where there aren't trails. So for that, these trail runners or even just a regular running shoe is fine. If you're going on a trip and you're new to this, you don't have to spend $200 on a pair of boots. Just wear your favorite running shoes. They're already comfortable. They're already broken in. Um, you're going to be fine, especially if you're on trail. You're even going to be fine for a couple days if you go off trail. What's the difference? The difference is, like I said, these are more flexible. So when you step on a rock off trail, let's say you step on a rock here. This sole is actually going to flex around the rock, which means your foot is going to flex. Your foot is going to feel the bumps. This is a platform, and you'll just step on the rock, and, and, and the boot's not going to really flex around the rock. Also, the thicker material, the heavier weight, heavier weight material, and the ankle support. I find off trail, you're, 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 you're putting your feet in weird places, and you're, you end up kicking rocks and brushing up against things. And when I would hike in the Sierra with shoes like this, I would come back, and my feet would be beaten up. It'd be beaten up. Now, let's also say that I'm six foot five and 215 pounds. That's a lot of wear and tear on my feet. If you weigh 160, you may be able to, this may be just fine. Um, also, my feet aren't super huge. This is a size 12. You know, some people my size have like 14 size feet. Um, so my feet take a lot of beating and I like to be able to move with my eyes up and put my foot somewhere and not have to constantly be looking down, worried about where I'm gonna put my feet. And that's why I prefer the heavier hiking boots. They're a lot heavier, right? This is probably two pounds for one of these, whereas this is a fraction of that weight. So if you're going fast and light and you're going to be on trail, I don't recommend heavy boots. I recommend lightweight trail runners or even just running shoes. Like I said, if you're going for the first time, just bring a pair of running shoes. Um, the other thing to note about them, though, is you're going to tear through them. I was uh, talking to a through hiker. Um, the Altra is another company that makes um, trail running shoes. They have a shoe called the Lone Peak that people really like. Altra, A-L-T-R-A. Solomon is the one that I have and liked. These are at REI. Um, he said in his through hike of the PCT, he went through like five pairs of these. He got like 200 to 400 miles per shoe. So those are like $150. So four times $150, you're almost going to be in the range of a $700 boot. So that's the other reason I like the boots is I wear them all the time now and I think I've hiked six seasons in these and they're great. They're, they're, they're not even, you know, they're just breaking in. <laughs> Whereas uh, a season in these and they're done, they're gone. There's no support. They're falling apart. Um, and you know, I'm not going to get on my soapbox about how the world today is disposable and we just buy stuff and we throw it away. Whatever happened to the good old stuff that you could use and you could pass down, you're not going to pass this down, but you know what I mean? Anyway, that's a soapbox for another day. But um, Okay, uh, REI, like I said, uh, or any of these places, uh, any place, any outdoor place will have a lot of these shoes. Just like a pack, the fit of the shoe is the most important thing. The most important thing. If you go in and you try on boots and you don't have any that you think are comfortable, don't buy them. Don't buy them and don't wear them. Just wear running shoes. Especially if you don't hike a lot. If you're just going on a trip and your feet aren't used to the shoes. So there are two things that happen. One is the boot breaks into your foot, right? The boot will, will change shape based on what your foot shape is. But the other thing is that your foot will get used to the boot, right? After hiking, the first time I hiked in these, you know, after a couple of days, I had a couple of blisters. And now my feet, because I hike in them, my feet get used to them. And where it used to be a blister, now it's just like thicker skin and hard cows. I don't get blisters there anymore. So the shoes that you hike in, you have to make sure are really comfortable. Even if they're trail runners like this, if you haven't hiked a lot in them, you're gonna get, you have a higher chance of getting blisters. But in general, I would say a lighter shoe is less apt to get, give you blisters than a heavier shoe. Um, okay, so talk about the fit of the shoe. Go somewhere where someone can help you with the fit. Um, that's really important. The basic way that Pete Limmer will tell you how to fit a shoe, and a lot of people will as well, is I'll use this boot, and this, pretend this is a leg and a foot. So this is your foot. Kick your foot way back into the boot. No. Yeah, you can do that. Kick your foot in the back of the boot, lace it up. Then press your foot forward, and Get it so your toes, press it forward real hard so your toes are just brushing the front. When that happens, you should be able to slip one finger behind your heel. So you want about one finger of space between your toes and the front of the shoe. 
or boot. Well, the boot. I don't know. Shoes could be different. Shoes are just kind of like put them on and see how they feel because you can just press and see. A hard, shoe, a hard boot like this is different. So kick your toe to the front of the boot and you should be able to slip a finger behind your heel. That's probably a good, um, a good, a good fit in, in a boot. Um, and like I said, you know, we all wear running shoes or trail runners or regular sneakers. You know how, you know if they fit or not. You know if they feel good or not. So trust that. And like I said, don't buy a new pair of boots the day before you go on a trip. That is just silliness. You will have blisters. And when you have blisters and your feet are in sharp pain, forget it. Everything goes out the window. Your trip is, <laughs> your trip is horrible. So um, let's talk a little bit about blisters. People do different things with blisters. When you get a blister, um, before you get a blister, you'll have what's called a hot spot. And that's like if you're really paying attention to your foot or if you happen to like take your shoe off at lunch, there's like a little red and it, and it sort of burns a little bit, but it's not a blister yet. You want to treat those hot spots before they become blisters. Once it becomes a blister, you've almost lost the game already. So if you have a hot spot, I've found the best thing to do. Some people like moleskin. Moleskin is not just a notebook, but it's, a, it's like a thick pad. And they, you know, they might cut it into a donut shape with a hole in the middle and then put it around so it reduces the friction. Blisters come from friction, from rubbing, when things are rubbing um, over a long period of time. So I hate moleskin. It's never worked for me. What I use is duct tape. And I carry duct tape on the trekking pole, which I'll talk about in a second, just rolled up on the, on the handle. And I make sure I have enough. So what I do with the duct tape is when I find a hot spot, just wrap it in duct tape. You know, you, you, there are tales on the internet of people running marathons with their feet encased and just totally wrapped in duct tape to prevent blisters. So it's very slippery, so it reduces the friction, and it just is a really thick barrier between your foot and whatever's causing the blister. So what I do is if I have a hot spot on this pinky toe, I'll just wrap it in duct tape. Just wrap it right up. Maybe put a, sh a sheet over the top of the toe or a piece over the top like this and then wrap it around. Um, if it's on the heel, I'll just put a piece of duct tape around the heel like this, uh, but duct tape is great. So if you if you get a blister, um, you can do the same thing. You can just put duct tape on it and forget about it. Um, if it's a small blister or if it's minor, um, but uh, likely it'll keep getting worse. And then you can read about do I pop the blister or do I not pop the blister. You know the blister is what it's doing is it's filling with liquid so that it can heal the skin underneath. Basically, um, a lot of people say if you pop it and you allow it to drain, then it'll just become a callus. Um, the next day, some people say you can, you can cut it from the side or you actually put a piece of thread through it so that it can drain. The, the, the fluid keeps coming in and so it can drain. I'm a popper. I'm a popper and a wrapper. I'm going to pop the blister, make it flat, put duct tape over it, um, and then check it. You know, every night, rip, you know, take the, I said rip, <laughs> rip the duct tape off. Does it rip off? No. If you go slowly, it's fine. If you have a blister there, it, yeah, you got to be careful because maybe it'll rip the blister off. So maybe you should put a little piece of gauze or even just like a something sterile between the duct tape and the blister so it doesn't rip the blister off. But it doesn't rip, rip your skin off. It you know it doesn't really rip your hair off. I sometimes just leave it on my feet when I get home. I'm in the shower and it just comes off. Or you take a piece of scissors and cut it. So that's blister uh, blisters. You can read about that more, but blisters will make your life hell and the best thing to, to the best way to avoid them is to have footwear that fits great okay cool so let's talk about socks if you're wearing low trail runners like this you can wear low socks um, smaller socks like this if you wear a thick boot um, I usually wear a thicker sock, and I'll tell you why. The first of all, the carnal rule of socks is don't wear cotton socks. Some people love cotton socks. Some people have never heard of anything but cotton socks. Cotton socks, cotton in general, when it gets wet, it loses its ability to keep warm. So if your feet are wet in cotton socks, you're going to be more likely to be have cold feet. And in my experience, cotton socks are going to cause blisters more and just be clammy and gross. Um, my preferred sock is a wool sock. Uh, these are all smart wool socks. I really like that company, Smart Wool. I'm using their socks for a long time. There's another company that everybody likes now called Darn Tough. Darn Tough socks. Same deal. Thick wool socks. So people uh, who wear running shoes or hikers often wear a thinner, lighter sock. The other thing that a hiking or trail running shoe is going to have is, is a lot more cushioning and a lot more foam type material. It's going to be softer through here. 
if you get a custom leather boot like this, this is an all leather boot. So there is no cushioning here, none. Um, and I had Pete make it so I could put insoles in mine. So I've got little like Spenco cushiony insoles and in, insoles in them. But um, there's not a lot of cushioning in here. And what and what the boot maker will tell you is, um, you get the cushioning from the sock. So you wear really thick socks. I wear these, you know, expedition weight, super thick hiking socks with these boots. But if I was going to wear a trail hiker, I'd wear much thinner socks. Um, the other thing to be careful of is. Um, not careful, but some people wear gaiters. Gaiters are basically just coverings that cover the top of the shoe and go up to your leg to make it so that you don't get rocks and stuff in your shoes, which is, which is annoying. Um, boots are, you know, something with high tops are less likely to have that happen, but gaiters are great. Um, some people wear two socks on the inside. I tried that for a while. I didn't like it. Some people wear a sock liner, a liner sock, so a really thin um, sometimes even silk or just a thin liner sock and then a thick sock. The, the idea there is the two socks can rub against each other and then the socks aren't rubbing against you, again, for blister prevention. I find that there's no difference. In fact, the liner socks just ends up bunched up and then I get a hot spot from where it's bunched up. So I wear one sock, uh, one thick sock in the boots. That's what I do. Another thing you can look into is insoles. If you need extra cushioning, there's insoles for that. If you need arch support, there's insoles for that. Just like apps, there's an insole for everything. So, um, but pay attention to your feet, do some test hikes. If you've never hiked before with your backpack and you never hiked before with your, with your shoes, throw 30 pounds in the back and go for a hike. Go for a local hike. People are gonna look at you like, what are you doing? But you know what? Being in the outdoors is not about looking cool or having a fashion show. And <laughs> that will come up repeatedly. Um, okay. So that's, that's that. Um, that's pretty much the boot and shoe talk. The last thing I wanna talk about is trekking poles. When I first saw people using trekking poles, I laughed at them and I thought they looked silly. I was like, oh, people, look, they use trekking poles. Um, and then I was having problems with my knees, especially coming downhill, and I tried using trekking poles and I have never stopped using trekking poles. So it's just a walking stick, comfortable handle up top, and a sharp point on the bottom and some of them have baskets and you can, this is what this is called is the basket. You can get a bigger basket. So if there's snow, the pole's not just gonna sink right into the snow, it'll catch on the basket. Um, again, you can pay a million dollars and get super lightweight ones, but these aluminum ones are pretty lightweight. Um, the idea is you've got two, you, well, maybe just one, you know, some people like, some people like one trekking pole. I like two trekking poles. And it's, for me, it's basically like having four limbs. Um, it means that if I'm going fast or something, uh, downhill especially, I don't necessarily need to pay as much attention to where I put my foot. I can maybe step on that loose rock because if I do and my foot, because if, <laughs> this is way too high for sitting. Um, and if I do, let's say I step on a loose rock and my, they come apart. I don't know, I imagine that, but they do. Um, let's say I uh, got the pole right here and I start to stumble. Well, I don't even have to look down. I have the pole on the ground already because I'm walking with them alternating like this. And I can just take the weight off what may be a turned ankle otherwise um, with my hands on the poles. So if you're walking with the poles and you can just stumble and you can place it um, and, and right yourself really easily and it just becomes, it becomes instinctual, you can get a great rhythm with them. Also, especially on the downhills, you can get your upper body involved. So on the downhill often, I'll put the pole way out in front of me and then I'll be using my tricep and my shoulder muscle. It's almost like doing dips at the gym, right? Um, as you're coming down, you're using your upper body to slow your momentum, which takes a heck of a lot of strain off your knees and ankles. And that's, I think, the best thing I've found about poles is that my knees don't hurt anywhere near as much, especially on the downhills. And on the uphills, it's also great because as you're going uphill, you can push yourself uphill. Right, it's like having four legs. It's really awesome for stream crossings and for balance. Um, you know, if you're crossing on a log, you can have these down in the water. Um, they're just, they're great. They're, they're invaluable. They're one of the things that totally changed my enjoyment of hiking. They made it way better. One thing, uh, if you're new, the wrist straps are hard to figure out how to use in the beginning. People are like, okay, so I go like this. Just a quick rule of thumb. The wrist strap is open. You wanna put your hand up from underneath it and then put it down on top of the wrist strap. Because what you want to do is you want to create uh, basically a little platform where you can put weight on the strap right there. If your hand's underneath it, you're, you're not 
that doesn't work. So go up from underneath, and you want to have the wrist strap there, so that when you're, especially when you're going downhill, you can, well, or uphill, whenever you're putting weight on them at all, the wrist straps can take the weight. So that's the way you use the wrist straps. The other great thing about trekking poles, if you start bringing them, is get a tent that pitches with trekking poles, because then you don't have to carry more poles. It's very easy. Um, the other thing I'll talk about later when I talk about photography is there's a new tripod that um, it was an idea that I had and I was like I gotta figure out how to make this and then I looked on the internet and of course someone had already done it brilliantly um, but it's a tripod that pitches with trekking poles so you don't have to bring a tripod either it's all about gear that does double duty um, so trekking poles I just learned about a new pole I saw a guy that had them called pacer poles you may, you may look into it um, it has a really ergonomic handle that puts the weight um, right here in the meteor hand um, and they're great anyway so that's trekking poles and that's uh, and that's boots. Again, uh, do what's right for your feet. Make your feet comfortable or you're not gonna have a good time on your hike. So if that's running shoes, that works for you, great. If that's a more you know serious trail runner or trail hiker, a little more durable, that's great. And if you wanna go the heavy boot route, um, the last thing I'll say about heavy boots is the reason I like a heavy boot is because I don't just walk on trail. I like exploring. If I was doing a through hike where it was gonna be 100 miles and I'm on trail the whole time, I may just wear Hike, like uh, trail runners because you're on trail you're not banging your feet around it's flat ground and it's a it's a well-trodden trail but I do a lot of off-trail exploring and scrambling and um, this that and the next thing and I find that heavy boots are, are really good to protect your feet and to provide a stable balance when you don't have a smooth trail to walk on so that's my talk about shoes um, and feet and walking and tune into my other videos and I'll see you next time wait a minute come back I forgot something I forgot to talk about camp shoes. Again, an ultralight hiker will say, you don't need a second pair of shoes. You got one pair of shoes and you wear them all the time. When you get to camp, you wear them. Okay, but what if your feet are tired and they're sick of being in these boots that they've been in all day? Especially if you wear a heavy boot. If you wear a trail runner, they're more comfortable. Uh, you're gonna maybe be able to just use that as a shoe at night too. I can't, I gotta get my feet out of these things. Um, and my feet love it. You know, like I said, I don't get blisters in these and my feet feel pretty damn good all the time, but still, it's just great to get out of your boots. And you wanna be able to walk around camp safely. Again, you're not inside, it's not carpeted or hardwood floors. Um, so what do you use for camp shoes? Um, you can bring a separate pair of running shoes. Let's say it's your first time and you really wanna hike in your new boots, but you haven't hiked in them a lot and you might get blisters. You could lash on a pair of running shoes, um, you know, in case that you get blisters and you can use them as camp shoes. Uh, here are some other camp shoe possibilities. Some people bring flip-flops. Flip-flops are super lightweight. The problem with flip-flops is if you want to wear a heavy sock, uh, you're going to have to put the sock through the flip-flop thong, and it gets cold. Your, your feet are going to be cold. You're going to want to be able to wear your socks in camp. The other bad thing about, well, not bad, but the other thing about flip-flops is you can't be too active in them. They flip and they flop. You know, they're not tight on your feet. You're not gonna like go explore a river in flip-flops and maybe slip and get hurt up in the backcountry. Or you might, but maybe it's not the smartest thing. So there's other alternatives. I present to you the world's most fashionable shoe, the Croc. Right, said no one ever. Um, so these are a very popular camp shoe. A number, a number of reasons. Some people say they're the perfect camp shoe. There's one drawback, which I'll talk about. Number of reasons. First, they look great because outdoors and being outdoors is about fashion show. You're gonna get photographed, your friends are gonna see you, they're gonna think you look awesome. False, false. They're totally hideous and you'd never wear them around. Well, you might. I was in Hawaii in 2005 and everyone was wearing these and it was like the coolest thing ever. Anyway, what's good about them? They're really lightweight. Now when I say really lightweight, they're not super, super lightweight. They're, it's almost a pound for two of these. Let's get the other one in here. There we go. It's almost a pound of weight, and that's a lot of weight. But um, they protect your whole foot. So if your foot's in here, you can go in that stream, you can be kicking rocks, and you're not gonna cut your toes. Also, you can swim in them. Um, I wouldn't, you know, in flip-flops, the flip-flop might just come off. <laughs> Oftentimes, you get in the water, and it's so cold that your body is just telling you to get the, out of the water as fast as you can. And that will cause you to scramble up whatever rocks or whatever's on the bottom, whatever sharp thing might be there, someone's old fishing hook, um, 
So swimming barefoot is not the greatest idea. If you cut your foot up in the backcountry, you're, you just don't want to do it. So I wouldn't swim in flip-flops, but Crocs are great because this little fashionable heel. Anyway, but you can walk around camp with the heel thing not there. And then if you want to swim in them or you want to be more secure, you can put that there and it'll lock your, it'll lock your heel into place. They also float, so if they fall off in the water, you're going to be able to find them. And probably the best thing about them is they dry almost instantaneously. They absorb absolutely no water. So um, you can cross a stream in them and then they're immediately dry. If you were to cross the stream in most other shoes, you'd have to wait half a day for them to dry out. So that's why Crocs are great. They're also nice and squishy. They're pretty comfortable. And even though this the tread is all worn out, uh, up in the Sierra, most of the granite is in incredibly grippy with these shoes, with, with all shoes, because it's, it's just um, pretty rough surface. But they grip pretty well. I mean, I know people that have hiked many, many miles in Crocs because their boots gave them a hard time. So, fashionable, lightweight, great camp shoes. These have been my go-to camp shoes. Until last week, I saw someone with something else that is half the weight of these, and I thought I had to try them out. So these just arrived. I haven't, uh, I haven't taken them on a trip yet, but I will in a couple weeks, well, next week. These are a company called Vibro Barefoot. No, Vivo Barefoot, V-I-V-O Barefoot. And they're just, they market them as super lightweight, waterproof running shoes. I wouldn't run in them. I like a little more support than that. But they're the same idea. It's closed cell foam, and they're actually half, they are half the weight. This is, I think, four ounces, so the pair is about eight ounces. These are the ultra pures, I think. Um, and it's a fully closed foot design, so it's probably even more secure than just this little foot strap. Um, also, Crocs are kind of bulky. They don't, they don't really, you know, pack it. They always, they always just like get last onto the pack somewhere on the outside. These guys, they you could actually just stuff that in. I mean, they're pretty um, pretty compact. So I've worn them around the house and they seem pretty comfortable. The grip on the bottom seems about the same. The sole's a little bit thinner, so I guess they'll probably wear through faster. But these seem like a great lightweight option. Um, the heel support and the and the um, the tensioner tie here means that you can probably they'll be more secure for swimming and for scrambling in lakes, uh, in rivers and stuff. Um, and so I really like these. I'm excited about them. Again, they're a total fashion item. Uh, but I'm excited to try them out because this is going to be the lightest weight camp shoe that I've found. All right, so that's just quickly about camp shoes. Now we're really done. I'll see you next time.